Well, we are nearing the end of the book. Um, I know Kevin read this book a while ago, and it's very popular. It's Ellen White's thoughts from different writings, different collections. And a lot of us as Adventists know that eventually we're going to be running for the mountains. But until that point, God actually wants us to eventually make the transition to the country. And there's some of us for like whatever reason, health, maybe age, sometimes even jobs, we might not be able to make the transition right now, but it's something we just want to be open-minded to, which obviously we all are. And we want to see what Ellen White and the Bible has to say about that. So tonight we're going to be going over chapters seven and eight. We're going to focus more on chapter seven because chapter eight is more like where should Seventh-day Adventist schools be built? Where should institutions be built? How should we raise the youth? And while that is important, I think chapter seven is probably a little bit more pertinent to the class. Um, chapter seven is, how do I move to the country? How do I know if it's God's will? Um, what if I don't have the money? How do I know where, how, where to look? Um, these are all practical questions that Ellen White graciously answers. And if you're interested, we posted it on the Fort Myers Seventh-day Amateurs Church YouTube channel. But we did a quick interview with my husband last night because he's always looking at property um, literally every single day. Um, he's always researching it. Um, he's encountered dozens of people. He's talked to a lot of people. He's read a lot on it. So he, he wanted me to say he's not an expert. In my opinion, he is. But he said, no, no, no. I don't want people to think I'm an expert. But I thought that he actually had some resources that we could find as being helpful. So if you want to listen to that, that's a more practical aspect. Um, it's a 20 minute interview posted on the um, YouTube channel, and he's going to answer some questions like, are certain locations better than others? What should you look for when you're looking at a piece of property? Um, what are some tools that you can use? But tonight, we're going to focus more on the spiritual aspect. And then if you want to get into the practical aspect, you can just view that at your own leisure. So tonight, we're going to see what does Ellen White have to say about the anxiety about the fear that we may have moving out to the country. And right away, she assures us God will open up the way. So if one person could please read this screen, and then we'll talk about the question at the bottom. At the time, God, as God opens the way, families should move out of the states. The children should be taken into the country. The parents should get as suitable a place as their mean will allow. Though the dwelling may be small, yet there should be land in connection with it. Parents can secure small homes in the country with land for cultivation, where they can have orchards um, and where they can raise vegetables and small fruits to take the place of flesh meat, which is so corrupting to the blood to the lifeblood uh, coursing through their veins. On such places, the children will not be surrounded with the corrupted influences of the city of life. God will help his people to find such homes outside of the cities. Thank you. So she mentions a few things we should be looking for when we look for property. Um, so what stood out to you? What are some qualities that our country property should have? Well, you know, for me, I, I see there, she says small homes. So I know that how I read that is um, live, buy a house within your means. And so you can afford more land, I'm assuming, um, where you can actually um, have a, a larger um, or better opportunity to grow more farming, right? Um, and that, that's where I really took out of that. Yeah, same, same as well here. Um, I know like when I think of farming, it makes me a little nervous because I know nothing about it. But as we're going to go throughout the presentation, um, she's just always reminding us God will open up the way, but he wants us to take small steps in that direction. And one of those steps is kind of just maybe practicing small, maybe a little gardening here or there. Um, Jeff and I are trying in our backyard. We have a really small place, um, but we have papayas, bananas, limes, um, mangoes. And our herbs aren't doing good right now, but that's our way of like beginning of trying because eventually we would like to be farming a lot more. But um, John and Marilyn, I don't know if you guys know this, but they have a gorgeous farm up in Michigan and they grow all kinds of things. So John and Marilyn, would you be willing to share maybe like how you got into farming and maybe any tips that you have for us? 
the major thing that I can say is that with a garden space is that you need, uh, you know, land that uh, is tillable and uh, with um, a decent pH, you know, pH is the, um, uh, whether it's alkaline or whether it's sour. And um, you need to also, um, the, the way I got into it was that when I was a little boy, my dad gave me a little piece of land and said, uh, raise um, vegetables and sell them to the neighbors and buy your own clothes. <laughs> and so I was about four or five at that time. And I did that for the next uh, at least 10 years and um, or about 10 years because I left home at 14. But anyway, uh, regardless, there was, um, it's a learning curve. My dad was a farmer and he had been a truck farmer. So he really knew how to put out vegetables. And uh, I learned a lot from him, of course, but uh, the major thing is that uh, you do a few things by trial and error, but I think if you can get some heritage uh, uh, seeds, uh, yeah, yeah. especially heirloom seeds that are like tomatoes or different things of, you can save the seeds from year to year and, and you can uh, have a lot of, of uh, real, real good um, vegetables and things that um, will uh, be very nu uh, nutritious. I try not to use any herbicides or pesticides and do most everything with um, uh, what is natural. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have, um, you know, I, I think I told all of you that I planted 15 uh, pear trees about, uh, which about seven weeks ago now, and they're doing very well. Pear uh, are the trees that take uh, the least amount of uh, uh, spray. And uh, you can use your own homemade sprays. Uh, one of the best that they talk about right now is uh, just a, a couple of uh, uh, teaspoons of um, baking soda and, and a few drops of uh, dish soap and spray the trees and that keeps the uh, pest uh, the pest off the uh, fruit and uh, but the pears take very little and and uh, the apples and other things take more i had planted a bunch of apple trees and different things about uh, probably at least 10 years ago and they're they're producing but um, a lot of things I keep seeds from year to year and, berries. and I've got berries and I, uh, you know, blackberries are very easy because they, the tops, you know, you just put the tops down into uh, the soil and they produce another plant. So there's just a lot of, um, a lot of things that you can do. And, and uh, my uh, belief is that um, do what you enjoy and, and uh, eat as much as you need and then give away as much as you can. And we give away a lot to, uh, to, the, to the mission. And I have awful lot of squash you know, each year, extra squash, hundreds of pounds. And I'll take that down to the mission in Muskegon. And they're very happy to get them in the, in the heirloom tomatoes and, and uh, whatever, else. whatever else I have. And I've kept bees, but this year, uh, something is bothering the bees and they're not doing well. So I'll try to figure that out. And I've had bees for at least 10 years. So I think that there's a lot of things that one can do. The one thing that I would say, um, I, I was like Jeff, I spent many days on the computer looking at property and I still do that every day because I, I feel like the farm is too large. It's 40 acres. And uh, there, we have a gentleman that helps us with the, the larger part of the farm. And John has, well, he has a good sized garden, but the man um, does spray the corn with pesticide. And I'm afraid that that may be hurting the bees. So I, I'm kind of looking for a farm that might be about 15 acres, maybe 10, but I think that 40 is too big. Well, it's incredible what you two have done. And thank you for sharing because um, just listening to you now, I've already learned so much, like especially about the baking soda, the dish soap. I didn't know that. So thank you. And this is encouraging because, you know, John and Marilyn, 
Um, God has really blessed them. They've been able to not only, you know, grow a lot of food for themselves, but like they've said, they're incredibly generous with other, or they haven't said it, but like, I can personally attest to the fact that they've been really generous to other people. I know they're really generous to us, to the church, and God will bless your efforts, however small they might be at first. So if you're nervous about moving out to the country, um, you don't have to be because God will help you find a place outside the city. And there's been multiple times where he's actually provided people with amazing deals that they would have never gotten otherwise. A lot of people get really concerned because prices are going up and up. But if God wants you out in the country, if you do the work, he will certainly prepare the way. And I realized that, like I said before, for whatever reasons, maybe because of age, maybe because of a job, uh, maybe because of a health condition, it might be hard to get out to the country. But as much as possible, sooner is better than later. So maybe if one person could read that paragraph, and then we'll talk about the two questions at the bottom. More and more as time advances, our people will have to leave the cities. For years, we have been instructed that our brethren and sisters, and especially families with children, should plan to leave the cities as the way opens before, the, before them to do so. Many will have to labor earnestly to help open the way. But until it is possible for them to leave, so long as they remain, they should be most active in doing missionary work however limited their space of influence may be. Amen. So what about you guys? Why is it better to move sooner rather than later? And if we can't move right now, what should we be doing? I really think that we're um, in a good place where we are. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to me that we need to be way out in the country um, because, you know, I feel like right now, well, we don't have enough land to plant things on, but other than that, I feel we are definitely in the country. I agree. I think you're in a great place. And I didn't put everything in this chapter because it was a long chapter, but she also had some counsel because she said there's some people out there who are always like, get out to the country as soon as possible, drop everything and move. And then people move, but they do it really rashly without planning it out. They get out there, they get bankrupt. Everybody looks at them like they're crazy because they didn't take any precautions and any um, preventative measures to help that from not happening. So it's not something that like you have to do. Um, I think especially if you have children, you definitely want to get them out of the city because we all know even in education, um, urban settings are drastically different than settings out in the country. But um, I think I agree with Sue and Phil, you know, Benita is a great place. I know in Fort Myers, I, Elva, I think is particularly beautiful. I know a lot of church members have some substantial property out in Lehigh. So wherever we are, we just want to make sure that we're working for Jesus because the yeah, benefit... Mommy. Oh, what were you going to say? Sorry, I was just going to say to my mom, you know, you guys are in a great place for like witnessing right now. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it's not city, but it's, it's not country either. It's maybe suburban. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when your neighbors are wanting to kill you, it's not going to be country enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it, uh, what it really comes down to is a comfort level for people. They need to find something that they can be comfortable with. Um, you know, I had this uh, one uh, fellow that I worked with. His wife was just scared to death of the, of, uh, the uh, country and scared to death of... Uh, uh, we drove into an area where the, the trees were um, coming all over the road and it, uh, it provided a lot of shade and darkness and, and it scared her. She said, roll the windows up. She was afraid. Um, I said to them at the time, each of us have our own comfort level. If you ask me, uh, and I've had to work in Chicago, as I've told you both folks before, but uh, if you were going to drop me in the middle of the uh, of, of um, Clark Street or, or State Street in Chicago at 2 a.m. in the morning or in the middle of a forest out here, Please drop me in the forest. Right. <laughs> uh, I uh, I just think that there's 
a, a comfort level that people have to find. And if you haven't been used to that, see, I grew up, uh, dad, you know, I grew up without a mother, as you know, and dad uh, would allow us kids or allow me especially um, to take my bedroll and basically go out into the woods for the whole summer. In the, and I'd sleep out there uh, throughout the summer. And so I got comfortable with the country at, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 years of age. And uh, I never worried about the animals out there because the animals didn't want to be near me any more than, you know, especially, the, you know, the, like the wildcats or anything. And so I, I never worried about that. So I think that uh, uh, it's, it's a comfort level and we need to find something that's, that's going to fit with each individual. Some people would uh, like to be in real mountainous areas, and I think some people would prefer to be in uh, more of the flatland, but I think it really comes down to a rural setting where you can uh, get the best air and the best um, nutrition and the best um, uh, space around you that you can be comfortable with, and, and that would really help with our children, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we always, uh, I encouraged my teachers. Uh, we had a uh, big track of land that was uh, purchased for a dollar in uh, back in the 30s. Uh, and they would take the kids uh, camping. And uh, we drilled a well out there and the teachers would take them out. And we even put up some uh, porta potties and so on and so forth. And uh, we'd have the parents go with them and it was so healthy. And, and very, very enlightening for a lot of the parents because they came out of Chicago. And once they their children got involved in it, they couldn't get enough of it. And they learned something about the plants that they can eat and, uh, and they uh, learn about, uh, you know, like the ferns in the early spring uh, produce a fiddler head and you can uh, eat those and they're kind of like eating uh, a green. And it, they're really, uh, you know, there's lots of things that are out there that people can learn about. I agree. It has so many um, health benefits. It has so many spiritual benefits. I think when I was a kid, I never wanted to live in the country because you associate it as being boring. If you're worldly minded, like I was when I was a kid and teenager, you don't really want to live in the country. But the more you see as an adult, the more you realize Eleanor really knew what she was talking about when she said as much as possible, we should get out in the country. And I like what John said, you know, know your comfort level. You know, what Craig said at one point, people are gonna be killing us. We're all gonna be trying to get as far into the country as possible. Um, but until that point, God works differently at each person on each family. And that was great advice John gave to just, um, you know, know your comfort level and realize it might be a little different for each family. But Ellen White does give a lot of practical advice because sometimes when I was a kid, it seemed like there was some eccentric people that were like, you have to drop everything, sell everything now, move out to the country. Jesus is coming. So I kind of always associated country living as being a scary thing, as something that um, I didn't want to think about and I didn't want to talk about. And apparently this was a big deal back in Ellen White's day. I took out a lot of paragraphs because it was too long, but in Battle Creek, apparently there was a bunch of people, like I think a hundred or so people that felt like they had to drop everything and move to the country. Um, but a lot of them didn't plan for that. And it really ended up in disaster. So she has some great counsel and this is good for all of us, especially if we're considering moving to the country. So if somebody could read this slide, then I'll go to the next slide. Somebody else can read that and then we'll talk about it. Those who have felt at last to make a move, let it not be in a rush, in an excitement or in a rash manner, or in a way that hereafter they will deeply regret that they moved out. Do nothing without seeking wisdom of God, who hath promised to give liberally to all who ask, and who unbridled not all that anyone can do to advise and counsel, and then leave those who are convicted in regard to duty to more move under divine guidance and with the whole heart open to learn and obey God. Amen. And someone else can read that and then we'll talk about it. 
Let everyone take time to consider carefully and not to be not be like the man in the parable who began to build and was not able to finish. Not a move should be made that movement and all that it portends are carefully considered. Everything weighed to every man was given his work according to the several ability. To his several abilities, according to his several abilities, then let him not move hastily, but firmly and yet humbly trusting in God. There may be individuals who will make a rush to do something and enter into some business that they know nothing about. This God does not require. Think candidly, prayerfully, studying the word with all carefulness and prayerfulness. With mind and heart awake to hear. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Finish. <coughs> there are, may be individuals who uh, will uh, make a rush to do something and uh, enter into some uh, business they know uh, nothing about. This God does not uh, require. Think candidly, prayerfully, studying the word of all carefully, or carefulness and prayerfulness with uh, mind and heart. Awake to hear the voice of God, to understand the will of God is a great thing. Amen. So what is a top concern? What is something we should remember if we're considering moving out to the country? Make some important plans. Yeah, preparation. Mm -hmm. And what are some practical things we can do to prepare? Like, what are some things we can do so that we're not acting rashly, we're not acting from presumption? Well, I Marilyn and I always sat down whenever we bought anything, like a piece of property, and we wrote down all the negatives, and then we wrote down all the positives. And uh, we tried to be very uh, uh, factual about, you know, uh, let's say uh, uh, there's a lot of problems with the, uh, uh, with the snakes in the area or the bears or whatever. Mm -hmm. write, a, write it down so that you actually see it on paper. And, uh, you know, I think I've said to most of you before, if you uh, write these goals down each year, uh, you have about a 96% chance of completing them. And if you don't write them down, you have about a 30% chance of completing them. So write things down and uh, be uh, prayerful about it. Uh, pay a real attention, like it says here, uh, to uh, what the Holy Spirit directs. And um, I think uh, uh, it really goes back to what someone said uh, about, uh, you know, the the Bible tells us not to do something without uh, uh, planning the cost. And I think it, uh, that to me is uh, paramount. One of the things that Marilyn and I made a rule of about, uh, oh, I, I'd say 35 years ago, we never did anything without paying cash. And uh, if you do that, chances are uh, <clears throat> you're not gonna lose anything uh, because uh, most property is going up in value. I think our farm is uh, many, many times over what we paid for it back in 2004. So I think it, uh, uh, these things are, uh, need to be thought out and, uh, and uh, like uh, it says here, prayerfully followed. Amen. And Kevin, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I, I think he hit on it. Just, you know, having a budget, knowing what you can afford, not stretching yourself. So when you get there, you're not broke. And uh, really being realistic about the cost of moving, right? Because right. It, it's not just, you know, there's there's lots of things involved with moving and, and settling in, in a new house that you're not accounting for currently. So yeah, how did you specifically choose where you live now? Um, were there like a few factors that went into that? Are you asking me? Oh, yeah. I was just curious. Like, is there like a reason? Because, you know, everybody chooses yes. their location. 
Yeah, so uh, the location was we were we've been here before and we knew what we wanted. And, you know, for me, I was selling my house in South Carolina and I knew a general idea what I was going to be able to pull out of that into the new house. And um, really what I could afford was, um, you know, wasn't it wasn't what the bank was going to approve me for. It was well below that. So I went in low. I said, this is all I want to spend on a house. And I knew the interest rates and I did the reverse math. And I said, okay, I'm only going to finance this much. I know I could get approved for more. And this is all I'm going to ask for. And, and we prayed on it. And um, we ended up, we bid on, I don't know how many houses, like eight. We were 0 for 8, super competitive. It was like one house had like 30 bids on it. And one of the houses that we bid on, who, what we're in now, uh, the bid went through and the realtor actually knew my realtor and they started talking like, Hey, I got this guy. He'll, you know, and then we worked out a deal and got an allowance on the house for the things that, um, the other buyer wasn't happy about and it just worked out. So that's, it goes into for us, it was praying, knowing that we were making the right decision and just staying on course and knowing what our budget was and, this is all we're going to spend because the house is, as soon as we started looking, the houses started going crazy. And I, I'm just like, I could afford that, but I'm, I'm not spending that much. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, you guys' this home is beautiful. And I love how it's like the backdrop is the mountain. So if you have to run for the mountains, they're literally like in your backyard. <laughs> right across the <laughs> street. <get> yep. <laughs> and Nancy and Hector, I know that you guys are actually moving. Is it in two weeks or so? Is it coming up? Well, uh, it's going to be sooner. It's going to be uh, next week. Wow. And what got you, like, was there something that stimulated you to go? Is there, like, a reason you chose that area? Yeah. We Well, what happened was that uh, we've been planning this for about three to four years, you know, uh, to move out to the country. So um, this year we started looking first that, you know, we started looking at uh, Georgia. But... Uh, uh, we we didn't find anything there. Uh, I guess the Lord didn't want us there. So uh, we just started uh, looking some more. And uh, and I just, you know, we, we prayed to the Lord that he would guide us to to where we he wanted us to go. And, uh, you know, one 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 night it was like two or three o'clock in the morning I was looking through houses, you know, in the a website and the internet and uh, and there was this house and uh, beautiful mountains and everything and uh, well we just called the realtor the next day it was available and uh, and we got it so I I I thank the Lord praise Him I I we we believe that it was the Lord that that I guided us to this property. Amen and. I know because I know a lot of people are scared and because um, somebody left a comment on the YouTube page, rightfully so, because she was saying in her country, New Zealand, you have to be really rich to move out to the country. And I totally agree with her because um, from a human standpoint, like you do have to have a lot of money for the most part, um, even, you know, undesirable acreage is still going up in um, value and in money. But God has clearly, clearly provided the way. And if you think candidly, prayerfully, study the word with all carefulness and prayerfulness, with your mind and heart awake to God, he will get you that property. And I wanted to share this Bible verse with you. My husband um, is not here right now. Like I said, he's at the vacation Bible school. But he did send me this Bible verse that really has encouraged him because we've been going to Tennessee for about 11 years now. And he started looking at property probably 10, 11 years ago, and it was so cheap, but we weren't married back then. So it's like, you know, and we weren't really sure like what route we would go. What I mean, with marriage, we kind of knew we were going that way, but we didn't know like what exactly the future would hold. So we didn't purchase anything in Tennessee and he still kicks himself because he's like, oh, it was so cheap back then. And now everything is sky high, especially where we're looking for in the Chattanooga area. But, um, you know, if we wait on God, God will provide the property. And this is a Bible verse that's really encouraged him. It's Psalms 37, 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. And he's done this with Kevin and Leslie, with Hector and Nancy, 
with, you know, John and Marilyn. So I know from a human standpoint, it can seem like you have to have a lot of money or you have to be really good at farming or you have to be good at negotiating. But if God wants you there and you're willing to do the work, he will open up the way. And for this last chapter, chapter seven, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it wasn't as pertinent to us as a group, but it's still important. So I just wanted to briefly highlight chapter eight. Um, the first part of chapter eight says that the country and the country alone is where the youth may be taught most effectively. So even if you don't have kids, this can apply to you as well. I know I don't have children, so this can actually still apply to me because adults are just as easily able to be corrupted as children are. So if somebody could please read these two paragraphs and then we'll talk about the questions at the bottom. God, God has sent a warning after warning that our schools and publishing houses and sanitariums are to be established out of the city and places where the youth may be taught most effectively what is truth. Let no one attempt to use the testimonies to vindicate the establishment of large business interests in the cities. Do not make of no effect the light that has been given upon this subject. Men will arise speaking perverse things to counterwork the very movements that the Lord is leading his servants to make. But it is time that men and women reason from cause to effect. It is too late, too late to establish large business firms in the cities, too late to call young men and women from the country to the city. Conditions are arising in the cities that will make it very hard for those of our faith to remain in them. It would be there for a great mistake to invest money in the establishment of business interests in the cities. Thank you. So what are the benefits to building Seventh-day Adventist schools and institutions in the country? Like we have schools, we have like publishing houses, maybe like some conference headquarters. Um, what are the benefits? Like why do you think they should be built in the country rather than the city? I think we ought to be teaching our young people, uh, teaching our young people to do um, some light, light farming type of things. And honestly, like when you look back on Adventist education, um, things were a lot better when the Adventist schools were out in the country. Um, people were able to pay off their entire tuition. Um, when my parents were in school, they were able to pay off their entire high school and college tuition without borrowing any money because they were working. And for the schools that were out in the country, they had their own, um, they had their own institutions, they had their own farming, their own businesses. And not that kids in the country like sin any less, but maybe their sins aren't as, um, how do you say it? as open, you know, there's not as much, nowadays is a little different, but even today, I don't think we have as much drugs and alcohol abuse in the country. You know, in the city, you can get it anywhere. You can walk two feet and buy drugs. The country, it's a lot harder. Um, same thing in the country, like we don't have as strong of an internet connection. So obviously the things kids are exposed to are gonna be a lot less. And <laughs> there's an Adventist school in um, Canada called Fountain View. And I think it's great. Honestly, if I had kids, that's one of the few Adventist schools I would send them to, but they don't even allow the kids to like have their phone with them in their rooms because they know that even if you're protecting them as a school, they could be looking up all kinds of crazy things in the room that is definitely going to go contrary to what they're being taught in the classroom. But the great thing about this is they don't force it on the kids. They actually like interview the kids and their families before they come to the school to see, is this where the child wants to be? because they don't wanna be a school where you get all these kids who are forced to be there. You know, they wanna be an Adventist school where the children wanna be there and they're willing to obey the rules. And as a result, they don't have all the issues that a lot of other Adventist schools have. So as a teacher, as someone who's been in Adventist education for a while, um, there are certainly benefits to having these schools out in the country. And even if we're not involved in education, um, Maybe this is good advice for all of us if we're ever on a board or something that maybe wants to invest some money building something in the city. Uh, maybe we could just remember this quote and realize that she said that it would be a great mistake to do that as much as possible. We want our conference headquarters, our publishing houses, our schools to be out in the country. And she said, though, we shouldn't give up on the cities. 
Um, there's a lot of people in there who are going to be turning to Christ. There's a lot of faithful Christians in the city. So at this point, she recommends working the cities from outpost. So if somebody wants to read these three short paragraphs, then we'll talk about the questions at the bottom. The cities are to be worked from outposts, said the messenger of God. Shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. As God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities as did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. When the iniquity abounds in a nation, there is always to be heard mm -hmm. some voice giving warning and instruction as the voice of Lot was heard in Sodom. Yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in the wicked polluted city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them, even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in the midst of any city, polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot in Sodom. Thank you. So what are some ways that we can still minister to city dwellers? We know we shouldn't live in the city, but we don't want to give up on people in the city. Um, so what are some practical ways we can still minister to them? I think um, what uh, people like Craig are doing, you know, in terms of uh, YouTube uh, ministry, uh, that that's something that goes right into the cities without any problem. Yeah, that's, that's technology, but even, um, and I've thought about, me and my wife getting people to do this is go set up shop and have your Bible study in like a, um, you know, a coffee shop down in the city. And, that, and then maybe you can attract people that way by sitting there and, and studying the word. Um, sure. Those are, two great, those are two great ideas. I like what, um, you know, John mentioned about Craig, having something on YouTube, you can reach people all over. Um, <clears throat> what um, Kevin said here about him and his wife, you know, having a Bible study in a city, you know, coffee shop draws people from all walks of life. That's amazing as well. Um, Marilyn, were you going to say something? I was going to say, I think the VBS is a really good way to draw people. I'm having a little corner where the parents can sit and watch the children and visit with them while they have some of the church members there to visit with them while they're uh, waiting for their children to finish is, is kind of a nice thing to do. And if you want a really easy, oh, what were you going to say, Elaine? Uh, I didn't, didn't have anything to say. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I saw the screen flash. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Was yeah. that someone else? I, sorry. If you guys want an easy way, which I know a lot of you do this already, um, but sometimes you travel through the city, like say through an airport, there's like thousands of people coming through on a daily basis. Uh, my husband always tells me to be careful because like he doesn't want someone to confront me or like to get in trouble for like hypothetically littering, but you could take these glow tracks and just like scatter them. I mean, you could put them on like the little coffee tables, the little dining tables, maybe if it's in the bathroom, no one's going to pick it up if it's in the stall, but maybe on top of like a towel dispenser or something. And people from all walks of life, um, dealing with all different kinds of things. And, you know, in front of you on the airport or in the airplane, there's like those safety books, like in the seat in front of you. Those are so boring, but you know, you sometimes look at them because you have nothing else to do. I always put glow tracks in there because maybe someone will be so bored all they'll have to do is read that glow track. I don't know, but um, that's a really easy way. I mean, it really doesn't take much effort. You just have it in your purse. You kind of put them in wherever you go. Does anybody else have any other um, ideas on how to minister to city dwellers? I like the idea of the glow tracks and, you know, having some here at home for people, service people that come in to do different things. Um, you know, that's a really good idea too, you know? 
Yeah, Brenda yeah. supplies a lot. If you're at the Fort Myers church, generally there's a lot of glow tracks. Like when you walk in, there's like a literature rack there. And Brenda, she's normally here, but she's at Vacation Bible School. You can also ask her because she has a lot of literature in the office. Um, you can buy it at the ABC. Like when we're in Chattanooga, we go to College Dale where there's an ABC. Sometimes they're half off. So I think it's like 100 for like $5.99 sometimes when they're on sale. Really cheap. Definitely well worth it. You can get whatever topic you want. Um, sometimes I have glow tracks that are really controversial, like something about the end of the world or what happens when you die. Um, I put those in places that might draw like conspiracy theorists, like bookstores, you know, because I always like like radical information. So I put that where people might be drawn to that. If I'm in a new agey place, I'll put stuff about like ancient prophecies that were fulfilled or something. But if I'm in a more like middle class to upper class place that might not necessarily be as attracted to that, I might put something about how to deal with loneliness or where is God when you're hurting. Um, Benita has a lot of those as well. I think when you walk in, they're also in the literature rack. Um, you could also talk to the pastor as well. So anything you need, generally the church has it or you can just order it online. Does anybody else have anything that they wanted to share? Um, I think John and Marilyn mentioned this. It was probably at a previous Bible study, maybe on Daniel or Revelation, or maybe it was our one on, probably our study on Genesis. But we were talking about Enoch, and they had mentioned reading chapter six of Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, chapter six is on Seth and Enoch, and Enoch was an amazing evangelist. Basically, he lived up on a mountain, and he would come down to minister to the people, to preach to them, but then he would go back up on the mountain because he was so scared that he would be contaminated by sin and that he would lose his horror of sin. So he would go down to the people, preach, minister to them, but he wouldn't stay and mingle. Um, he wouldn't go to their entertainments. Um, he didn't actually live in the city. He went down there with a specific purpose. And <laughs> this was great because she does tell us that he did win many souls. Now, we don't know if those souls were killed. They might have been because only eight people got on the ark. They might have died. Um, they probably were killed. But he did win souls to Christ from his city ministry. So we don't want to forget the people in the city. Um, but we want to be really careful to guard ourselves and to guard our families as well. And when she was writing this and I was reading it, I was wondering about the churches in the city. Because we do have schools in the city. We do have churches in the city. Um, but Ellen White reassured us, like, we definitely still need to have churches in the city. Um, just because we're pulling out of institutions, just because we're moving out to the country, <clears throat> doesn't mean that it's wrong to have a Seventh-day Adventist church in the city. So if somebody could read this, that would be great, and then we'll talk about it. Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers. In these cities, we are to have houses of worship as memorials for God, but institutions for the publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick and for the training of workers are to be established outside the cities. Especially it is important that our youth be shielded from the temptations of city life. We are to be wise as serpents, and harmless as doves in our efforts to secure country properties at a low figure. And from those, from these outpost centers, we are to work the cities. So, so thank you. We're definitely supposed to still have churches in the cities, um, but I know I can attest to the fact it's a different type of worship experience sometimes when you go to the cities. Um, my husband and I were recently in Miami and honestly, it was hard to find, a, it really was hard to find a church that we felt comfortable with. Um, Thankfully, he had ended up, there's an Adventist who moved to Tennessee who still works down here, and he had mentioned a place, um, but it was a little far from us, so we couldn't go. So um, even though there still are churches in the city, um, the city can still have its influence on them, but there's many faithful people still in those churches. Um, just like in the days of Elijah, there were 7,000 people that had not bowed the knee. So sometimes it might feel like there's only a few people who are really walking with Christ, but we have to remember there are literally thousands of people who have the same thoughts that we do, who have the same attitudes toward Adventism, who are looking for Jesus' second coming. So to me, that's really encouraging. So 
as we kind of wrap it up here, um, I just wanted to ask you, what are some things that stood out to you about the chapters? Um, is there anything from your personal experience you'd like to share? Um, anything about country living, um, any tips you might have, um, any resources or anything <laughs> that stood out to you? One of the things that I think is, is really important is understanding how to grow things in that particular area that you live in. Um, when I was studying gardening, um, we had people from the north in the classes and they wanted to grow things like they did up north. Well, that doesn't work in Florida soil. You know, with Florida soil, you need to kind of mix your own soil. Uh, with peat, uh, fine sand, and, and very small rocks that haven't been exposed to, uh, to salt. And, you know, you can grow things uh, that way a lot better. You can have more nutritious vegetables and fruit if you grow according to the location that you're in, because a lot of the ground and uh, has been depleted of all the uh, minerals and, and uh, nutrition that we need today. That's a really good point. Like when you bring up just the depletion, it makes me think of pollution as well. I know for a while my brother wasn't eating rice because of the arsenic in it. Cause even if you get organic rice, apparently it still, I don't know, it gets its arsenic from the environment. Um, so, but then we were studying it and supposedly like if you soak it for 24 hours that removes 90% of the arsenic. So now that's what Jeff and I do all the time. Like we just soak it, you know, 24 hours ahead of time. We would have never known this except like my brother brought it up. But I agree with you, Elaine, just like knowing the environment, knowing what grows good, what doesn't grow good. Um, it's definitely a learning process because I'm at the beginning end of the scale. I have a lot to learn. So little things like what you guys have been sharing, what my brother's been sharing, um, that definitely has helped me. So what about you guys? Like, are there some things that you do personally or things that you've learned maybe about country living or about like just life in general that you'd like to share? Mrs. White has a uh, prescription for us in terms of planting things like trees and uh, other things. Take the time to read that because it uh, will help you in terms of uh, learning to uh, put the proper drainage underneath the tree and and, uh, and uh, it really helps to uh, keep the trees from uh, having a problem. I think, Craig, did you do a seminar on that one time? Do you remember, John? Um, I, I do have a couple of... Uh of studies on my YouTube channel about how to re remineralize the soil and how to restore the soil. And I actually have you know, tons, a, a lifetime of, of material on gardening for anybody who's interested. I could give you tons of links. Do you mind just giving like your email? Just, I mean, are you okay with if it's online, sure. your email? Oh yeah, if you just want to say your email, that way if someone's listening, they can write it down. Sure. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, for gardening questions, you can send it to, I have an email address. It's called 4healthrestoration, the number 4, healthrestoration at gmail.com. And I'll send that out to the group as well, but I know sometimes people are not on here, but they like to listen. So Amen. do you mind just repeating it one more time? Sure. It's the number 4, healthrestoration at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thank you. You got it, Chris. I mean, if somebody else has a different email for me, you can email me there, but that's that's the way I do a lot of my health ministry is through that email. So I have all the emails already in that account. So if you guys are interested in coming back next week, it's actually our last study. We went through the whole book. Um, we'll be at chapter nine. It's called Emergency Flight in the Last Days. And as I went to prepare the study for next week, I was totally shocked when there was only one paragraph, literally one paragraph on like how to prepare. Um, I think we should know a little bit more than one paragraph. So I believe this is providentially 
but I was listening a long time ago, maybe a year ago to this woman on YouTube. Um, she has this ministry called Closure for Jesus. And it was how to prepare for the time of trouble. But it was like really practical things. Like we're not supposed to be neurotic. We're not supposed to be rash. We're not supposed to worry about it, but we shouldn't ignore it. And she had some like really practical things on like how to prepare for the time of trouble. So next week, we're gonna like kind of go through some of that and basically talk about what are some ways we can physically prepare, but what are some ways that we can spiritually prepare as well? Because sometimes there's two extremes in the Adventist church. You have people that are so obsessed with it. They're so scared and so neurotic. Um, basically, whenever they talk about it, they get like really animated, but kind of in a scary way. And as a result, other people go to the opposite extreme and they never want to talk about it because it scares them or they think it's not important. And you guys aren't like that. Like you love Jesus. So I feel like you're middle of the road. You're passionate about Christ, but you also want to be ready for the end times. Um, so you've mastered the balance, but I definitely don't want to skip over that chapter because it is really important that we prepare. We don't have to be neurotic, but we should be preparing. So if you want to come out next week, um, same time, same place, then we will take a break the following week, and then we're going to start a new Bible study in August. So after this, I'll send you out the information about the new Bible study as well, um, just in case you're interested. So with that being said, thank you for coming out. Um, we have a lot going on. Elaine has surgery on July 22. Um, Kevin, who is normally on here, um, he's had some surgeries, he's had some sicknesses, so we definitely want to keep Kevin in our prayers as well. And there's a lot of people on our Bible study and even in our churches who have just been sick. Um, and, you know, it's it's personal, so I don't like always rattle off a list of names, but I ask that you just keep them in general in your prayers as well, because it's the last days, we're all getting sick. Um, you know, it's it's normal, but we still want to keep them in our prayers. So does anyone else have any praises or prayer requests? Well, I'll just update that uh, Kevin is doing well. He's pretty much recovered from the COVID he got in the hospital and he's doing as well as possible after his most recent surgery, though it will be a few weeks till we really know the results. So please do keep him in prayer. Thank you. No, thank you for the update. That's great news. Thank you so much for the prayer. Absolutely. Well, if you don't mind, I'll end up praying. Um, actually, I have the privilege. I shouldn't say it like that. I'll end up praying. Like, thank you. I, I have the privilege of praying. So if you don't mind praying with me. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you so much for our Bible study group. Um, it's exciting and it's really encouraging to meet with fellow believers who love you, who are excited about your coming, and who just want to be more aware of last day events. So I ask that you bless each and every person on here. Uh, bless their spouses, bless their families, bless their households, um, pour your Holy Spirit out upon them, and please just enable them to witness to people all around them. I know we all want to do more, so I ask that you just open up our eyes this evening and this week to more ways that we can serve you. And thank you so much that Kevin is doing better. Thank you so much for the ways that you've brought him through, and I ask that you continue to be with him. Um, I know you've done the same with Elaine. You've brought her through so much. I ask that you especially be with her on July 22 and in the recovery period as well. And we ask that you be with the many people um, that we know through our Bible studies, through church that are serving you, bless their efforts, especially those that are doing vacation Bible school. And also please be with the many people that have been sick as well. Um, I ask that you please heal them, Lord. And last but not least, I ask that you be with Hector and Nancy as they get ready to move. Um, this is exciting. You've opened up this opportunity for them. And I ask that you just bless them and be with them the entire way. In your holy and precious name, amen. 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 amen.